All right. Well, welcome. This is YSS Let's Talk Live every Thursday night, 7 p.m. right here uh, on our YSS Facebook page. And tonight I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to be talking about the um, residential um, adolescent addiction treatment program. And we have some experts with us that are going to be talking. Um, who, who know all of the information. Let me first introduce uh, Timothy Martinez, the YSS Lead Youth Recovery Specialist. We also have with us Andrew Allen, our YSS president and CEO. So welcome to you both. You're looking great tonight. What's that? <laughs> You're looking great. Well, I got my hair cut. It, it looks looked good. It Thank looked you. real good. Literally like two hours ago. Well, maybe an hour ago. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm kind of trying to up my game here, but then you look um, good too. Well, and, oh, and man. appreciate it. <laughs> well, you both look absolutely phenomenal, and tonight we're we're talking about. Um, well, uh, let me just move in right away, Tim. I want to sure. ask you. I, I see your title as YSS Lead Youth Recovery Specialist. Can you summarize that up? What is it? And what is it that you do? What's what's the program about? Sure, um, I love to do it, Rusty. Um, so basically, um, you know, I've been working here for close to three years, and you know, I you know got the opportunity um, to start as a, just a floor staff, working with the clients every single day. Um, and you know, obviously, I've loved the job. I'm still here. I'm, I've moved up a little bit here, and so my role has changed since I started here. Um, and so right now, I have a bottle roll and just um, everyday, you know, nuances of a client's schedule. Um, I help maintain the schedule. I help add in key components to their treatment program, the programming um, every day. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it be therapy groups, whether it be just sessions with various different uh, facilitators that we have uh, coming into the houses to educate, um, to build awareness with these individuals that we have here in residential. Um, and I, I um, you know, I have great pleasure in saying that I get to work, you know, one on one with these individuals in our residential programs, as well as with parents, um, with their counselors, with their therapists in the program. Um, so, um, yeah, I kind of have a daily hand uh, in their day to day life and what they do. And, uh, you know, hopefully the growth that they're able to maintain as they're in our programs. Awesome. So you just talked about so much about like the clients and the day to day routine and that kind of stuff. What are we talking about? I mean, what what like, you know, for the folks that are just tuning in, wondering sure. what are we talking about when we're talking about residential adolescent addiction treatment program? What is that? So we're, we're talking about individuals that come in and, you know, they kind of lost guidance in their life. They don't have great supports maybe in their life. Um, you know, they have a lot of different, um, you know, problems that they may be going through, whether it be mental health, um, just social problems that they may be going through. Um, you know, we have two separate houses that, uh, that house female and male clients that come in through our programs. Um, um, and they're just, you know, not just the clients themselves, but families that are also in, in search for help and, um, and guidance and uh, their everyday lives and just guidance just to help them through the problems and um, the different, you um, obstacles that a lot of, you know, not just our clients that come through our programs, but anybody in life, you know, obstacles yeah. that they just, you know, some people need extra help in uh, providing, getting that support from uh, outside resources rather than just the parents themselves. And so, um, you know, we have, you know, every client that comes in has a different story. Every client comes in has a different background. And that's why I'm just, I'm, I'm gl so glad to be able to work in a place like that, that can tailor to every client's need and every family's need that walk through our doors. Yeah. And, and you just, I mean, like you said, everybody's story is different. We know that there's a need out there. We sure. know that we have, st there's something called the Iowa Youth Survey, which myself, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Rusty Johnson, prevention specialist. Hey, Rusty. Yeah, hi, hi <laughs> I'm, I'm here. So I go in and I, I do a lot of drug education. I do a lot of sexual health education in our school system. And with this survey that I've helped administer throughout the year, we get this data that's up here on the screen right now. And we see here 90%, I mean, that first one I'm reading, 90% of those who are currently addicted began using alcohol and other drugs before. 
the age of 18. Now, and, and let's keep that screen up there, but, but uh, Timothy, what are the ages of the kids that are in the residential programs? Um, so yeah, we, we can uh, house kids from ages anywhere between 12 and 18 years old. Wow. Um, and I forgot to mention earlier, we also have another site up in Mason City, the Francis Lauer campus. So let's not yeah. forget about that program because they do a wonderful job up there in Mason City as well. Um, but yeah, we have we house kids from anywhere between 12 and 18 years old. And again, every story is different. And you know, when they come in, no matter the age or what they've been through, you know, we have, you know, what any family is looking for, you know, the support and the guidance and resources to help them get through their uh, obstacles in life that they have. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'd love to talk about the program a little bit more in Mason City because absolutely, I mean, we got programs um, um, throughout the state. And so this is wonderful. But um, going, you know, those stats up there on the screen. Wow. that That is something. I mean, so we have, you see on average two kids in a class of sixth graders have tried using alcohol or other drugs. On average, three kids sure. in eighth grade. These these ages that you're talking about, they've tried using alcohol and other dra drugs. And this is just in the past 30 days that we're talking about. So you can see where addiction starts. You can see how early it can start. Mm -hmm. And that, that we're there to, you know, with the program that you're talking about and that we're going to talk about um, a, a lot more here. So, Andrew, I well, want to bring you up. I'll tell you the tough please. statistic. I've got, uh, they're running around here. I've got a, a pair of uh, seventh graders. So I, I sure know my own personal experience having gone yeah. through, uh, you know, quite a bit of adversity as a kid, but it's hard for me to imagine that my seventh graders are hanging out with other kids that are potentially uh, drinking and using. You know, and and we, we the, the statistics that, that we gathered that from, again, is called the Iowa Youth Survey. And any folks that are watching this that want to get some more information on this, you can go to idph.gov. You can go and, and get that information and exactly what you're talking about, Andrew. They even gather information about how comfortable it is or how accessible it is to just hang out with folks that are doing drugs and alcohol. And it's concerning. I went through and I looked at some of that data today and it is, it's concerning. And, and this is of course the field that we're in. And with Timothy, you are working with youth now that have been, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Andrew, and help me out, but kind of a byproduct of this, or, or I don't want to say a victim of it, but you know, ultimately, you know, with, with addiction and, and, and issues. So we have these programs. And I'll never forget when I first started at YSS, I went to one of the houses to teach a, um, a, a course and it was a drug education course. And I walked in and I walked into a living room. It was a living room. I thought I was going to walk into like kind of more of an industrial setting. No, this was a living room. There's bedrooms. There's, I mean, it, it's really a, a, a living place. It, it's a house. Um, and this program. So Timothy and Andrew, um, I know you both know a bit about the history of, of the programs here in the houses that were just shown. Can you talk a bit about that, about the history and about these houses, what they're like? Yeah, I mean, you, you've got a slide up there that's probably uh, the, the most notable piece of history. Gorgeous uh, home. 804 Kellogg. This is a uh, uh, youth Recovery House. Um, it's been uh, within YSS ownership since uh, the early 1980s. Uh, and I was actually living there 25 years ago today. Um, we were living there. That's right. The place that Tim works, um, where he mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, exposes kids to hope and opportunity. Um, this is where my life was transformed. And uh, you go way back. And this is actually where George Washington Carver lived. When he transferred from Simpson, the, the way that I understand the story is that he transferred from Simpson to Iowa State. And at the time, African-Americans weren't allowed to live on campus. And so he had to find a place off campus. Uh, this was a the, kind of the Bud Mansion. Professor Bud lived here. He brought in George Washington Carver. I think he stayed in the basement for a period of time. And uh, because of that history and just the significance of a guy like George Washington Carver, um, uh, this house is actually on the National Historic Registry. So 
we're, we're pretty proud of it. We share that history with the kids as they come into the program. Um, I feel like they too, while they might not fully appreciate it, they too are proud of the fact that um, this this facility, this building, this home essentially has so much uh, history and you know played a significant role in uh, you know ensuring that George Washington Carver made the impact on the the world that he did. Absolutely, and so we and again Andrew and and Timothy, that house we brand as or we call Youth Recovery House. Youth Recovery House. Yep. Okay. So uh, let's throw, do we have another picture up there that we can put of another house? Because this is exciting. We have actually multiple houses. Um, and so I, I think that we also have 712. Um, sure. So the, the, if you think about the community-based nature of the way that uh, George Blitzos, our founder, uh, built YSS, you know, he really wanted programs ingrained in the communities. And so- Correct. Um, you know, he, uh, he st started just with a, a volunteer board, no paid staff, and grew the organization over time. And uh, folks uh, on occasion would have houses that they would donate because essentially we started as a drop in center um, for runaway and homeless youth. We started the first emergency shelter in the state of Iowa. And you can't work in emergency situations, crisis situations long without asking yourself is there something that we could have done? Um, mm -hmm. to prevent this in the first place, Rusty. That's where you work. So a third right. of the resources at YSS go into prevention on the front end. Then you have crisis situations and you've got to figure out what do we do with these kids? And uh, what George realized and the community realized is a lot of these kids are bad into drugs and alcohol and uh, and they needed more than uh, just shelter. They needed treatment. And so YSS opened one of the first adolescent residential addiction treatment programs in the state. Um, I'm so proud of the program. I am an alumnus myself. I shared that I share that proudly. It's on my email signature. Um, it's the reason that I am where I am today. We've served more than 5,000 kids wow. over, over the course of a uh, uh, 35 plus year history. And you can see the locations. Um, 712 was for 712 Burnett. You know, some folks might remember we actually had a fire there two years ago yesterday. I was just looking at my Facebook feed and it's not something that mm -hmm. um, I necessarily like to bring up, but it is part of our history. Um, of course, everybody uh, got out safely and, you know, really, really appreciate the community response after that happened. Uh, and now we're in some uh, temporary digs until we get the new digs. But this, um, the two facilities on the left, the girls program at 712, the boys program at Youth Recovery House, they are... Um, you know, really home-like. You walk into the space, you feel yeah. like you're at home. The space on the right, you can see that that's our Mason City location that uh, Tim referenced. And uh, we opened up what is Iowa's newest adolescent addiction treatment program in February of 2018. Um, I'll just give a shout out to, you know, Steve and Vicki Sukup, who um, had a vision for a world-class addiction treatment in North Iowa. And uh, they came alongside Francis Lauer, who they've supported for many, many years. And uh, when Francis Lauer and YSS merged, the fact that we had been doing adolescent addiction treatment, they said we wanted up in North Iowa. We piloted a program in a small building. We moved it into a larger building because the demand was so great. And right now, this space is in the, we haven't really launched it officially, but if you're watching, you're gonna, you're gonna know it. Uh, and if you're in the community in North Iowa, you're gonna know it. We've essentially got a $4 million capital campaign, a renovation of that space. Wow. And it's transforming the space into more of a home-like feel, just like we have uh, at the 712 House and Youth Recovery House in Ames. And this, again, this is incredible. I mean, and one thing you hit on, Andrew, that I do wanna hit on real quick again, one thing I love about YSS is yes, being a prevention specialist, going through all the trainings that I do on prevention side of things, you know, kind of preventing things from happening. YSS covers it from point A to point, well, can I say Z? Sure. You know, we go all through, you know, from Y to S and S or yeah. yeah, I, yeah. All, the, all the, the letters, you know, through wow. prevention, the behavioral health, the transition services, um, the, the child welfare, emergency services. And so, Again, with with Tim, I want to get into some more of the specifics here. Um, sure. The program that we're talking about. So if I was to lay out before admission, so when the youth come in before admission, then maybe during the actual admission, and then after admission. So if we take it yep. kind of three steps there. So I know some folks, um, well, well, let's just put this out there right now. How do families and individuals, how do they get help or identify someone who 
needs help to get into these programs or get sure, into that's, them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think first off, you know, there needs to be that awareness of knowing like, hey, you know, we need that extra help. We need that extra support. Um, and so, um, you know, there's many different, you know, social outlets where people can reach out and ask for help. And, but, you know, our main thing are, you know, therapy, I mean, therapists, uh, counselors out there, uh, juvenile court officers out there. Um, we, we do extensive reach out into the communities, not just in the central uh, Iowa areas, but I mean, out far East Iowa, West Iowa. Um, I mean, we have clients from all over the state of Iowa. And we had a young man clients. came from Florida. There's Absolutely. a lot of in Florida and the family oh, sure. wanted him in a, a different setting. They wanted him out of the state. They flew him up here from Florida. It was pretty impressive. Wow. Yep. Um, and that, that's a great thing about w what we do here at YSS, you know, you know, if we, if you need the help and we can provide that support, you know, let's bring them in, let's see what we can do okay. to help change that individual's life. Um, so, um, and like Andrew was, you know, mentioned, I mean, we accept anybody from, you know, if we can help them any, any way, um, you know, let's bring them in, let's, let's see what we can do for them and for that family, um, and see if we can provide, uh, the the building blocks of a successful life after they leave here. That's what we call Iowa nice. Wait, yeah. I think that sure. has a couple of meanings. But yes, Iowa not you know serves everybody, and 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 to do that now. So let me also ask, and I know this is going to be a question. I haven't checked the live comments yet. Actually, let me get that out of the way right now too. For those that are watching live, there's a special treat. You actually have a comment box. You can actually put some comments in or questions. Um, and we would love to see those. You comment, we'll comment on your comments or we will answer your questions, hopefully. But I know one of the questions, Timothy uh, and Andrew, is what about insurance? You know, if we're talking pre-admission even, let's go there. What, what about the insurance? Yeah, I sure. think we've kind of referenced a lot of different programs at YSS. The right. from where Tim works that we're talking about today, these are kids that have a primary diagnosis of substance use disorder. So essentially they've been using drugs and alcohol to cope with life. It's become you know a significant issue. They've not been able to stop on their own. They've probably seen a counselor or been in some sort of outpatient treatment program. The family is desperate and hopeless. And, and one of the great things about YSS, and it is our model, it's our community-based nonprofit model, is that there is not a kid out there that we probably can't serve. So some yeah. folks do have insurance. They've got private insurance, they're employed, they've got, um, you know, maybe they've got a copay and uh, uh, out-of-pocket, um, small out-of-pocket amount, but insurance will pay for residential treatment. If folks don't have insurance or if they're lower income, um, Iowa has a great Medicaid system, and so uh, Medicaid pays for uh, treatment. And in the case that, and it's rare, it's very, very rare. In the case that we don't have private insurance or Medicaid, we've got other third-party funding sources as well. So um, I, I would say funding or paying for treatment for adolescents at YSS is, is almost never the issue. So, and if, if we can help, it, it, we can pretty much help, like you just said, anybody who's seeking help with, within our area. and. Timothy, let me ask you this. You go through the admission process. We're talking about admissions right now. What's that What's that process like for a youth coming in? Sure. Um, I, I think the most important step is just getting that assessment. What What does that child and what is that family, what, what do they need? What, what type of support do they need? Um, and you know, what, what can we do to help that, that family in general? Um, I think it's also important to realize that, um, you know, every family, you know, like I mentioned before, comes from a different background. And so, you know, meeting, you know, whether it be financial needs or um, just other, you know, needs that they may need, it's important to understand the entire picture um, of that family and, and their needs. And, you know, because, you know, a anything that we do here, um, you know, if we're not handling things the, the way we should, if we're not, uh, providing the right services for them, you know, what, what are we doing? So I think the first and most important step is realizing what is it that they truly need and how can we help them the best that we can? So kind of like a comprehensive approach. Yeah, sure. It, it really is. I'm, I'm speaking from experience and, you know, working alongside these families uh, like Tim does every day. Uh, it is not easy to experience addiction. 
Um, th these are families that oftentimes have tried everything. Uh, they've gone to counselors and therapists. They've asked professionals. They've, you know, um, they've tried treatment programs. Um, th these are folks that are really at their wits end, um, don't know where to turn, are desperate for something different. And, and I'm telling you, um, our, our program is great. Um, our facilities are nice. Um, but the differentiator, when I talk to kids on their last day of treatment as they're graduating, and I ask them, what was the best part of treatment? Or, or what do you remember most? Or um, what was most impactful? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, almost without exception, they say things like, Tim, T Tim really invested in me. He, he cared about me. He, he grew me. He believed in me. Um, the connections that these kids make with our staff, it's, it's the most important thing. Um, these are kids that uh, have been through the ringer. Uh, while they may seem defiant, uh, they're also uh, desperate. Uh, while they may seem uh, like they know it all, uh, they're, they lack confidence. And so we, we accept kids into our program who are, are broken and have experienced trauma in many ways. And Tim and the staff at Youth Recovery House, 712 House, and at Francis Lauer up in Mason City, they start to love on these kids in a way that builds trust. Um, they hold them accountable, right? Because if you're a kid like me, if you're a kid who's experienced addiction, generally you're pretty hard headed and you're, you're going to do what you can to get your own way. So they hold them accountable um, to the point that I think where th they ultimately surrender and say, okay, we can't keep doing it our own way. And, and they accept help from the staff. So I, I, uh, um, that, that might've been out of order, Russ oh, and Tim, but um, I, I just want to say, um, it's, it's the investment, Tim, th three years with the agency, been promoted a couple times. I talked to him on the phone earlier this week and he was just itching to get back to work, to talk to the kids because <laughs> of the investment that he makes. And I know you're laughing, but that's what you, you know, it, that's sure. the truth. We, we had that conversation. And so, uh, I, I couldn't be more thankful for. Uh, Tim, or Rusty, for our people, because you guys are what make uh, our program successful. You guys are the, the the secret sauce that really helps to transform lives. Well, and as mm -hmm. we're just talking about, you know, the graduating or, or kids graduating out of the program, just today I was teaching a sexual health class in um, one of the houses, in, in one of our residential programs. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm Zooming the call or Skyping, I guess you should say. And I'm teaching this and I said, okay, class, we're done. Good, you know, great, I'll see you next week. And Rusty, Rusty, stop. And one of the youth had to run up in front of the camera and Tim, I think you might've been there, I can't. But one of the youth had to run up in front of the camera and look and say, I'm graduating. And I'm so excited and so, you know, and just that sense of accomplishment. And there is so much that goes into this. And once they come into the houses and they start that process, there's so much that goes into it. And I know that there's structure. I know that there's routine. But Timothy, can you tell me a little bit like, um, well, first off, let me ask you this. How long How long do kids typically stay at the houses? Sure. Um in our, yeah, in our residential programs, we're looking, you know, around 90 to 120 days on average. Um, again, you know, s depending on the support they need, it can be a little bit longer, but yeah, you're looking at about 90 to 100 day program. Okay. And what does a typical day look like or what's like a schedule? Sure. Um, I mean, they get up, they have three meals a day, like, you know, any normal kid would have. And um, you know, they go through, a, you know, extensive therapy uh, groups with counselors that we have on site, um, as well as individual therapy sessions with uh, different therapists off site and on site. Um, and it's not just, you know, they come in, it's just like, you know, treatment and doing this work and that, you know, we need to teach them how to, you know, learn to be kids again and learn how to uh, live life and have fun and um, just appreciate, you know, them for who they are and just, you know, really kind of dig into like what they're good at. And, uh, you know, some kids come in, they just, they don't know what they're good at. They don't, you know, know what they like to do. They don't know what's fun in life. And so they come in um, and we can help that, you know, build those, uh, those building blocks and help them, you know, find, find that guidance back in life and 
Um, so, you know, we do uh, activities such as wellness. We like to get them out, get them active, you know. Um, a lot of kids come in, they're just used to sitting around the couch watching TV, playing video games, talking on the phone and things like that. So getting out, getting uh, active, trying new things, um, um, and just, you know, being more social, if you put it in another way, just get to know other people, learn how to interact with other people, learn how to work through the problems that, you know, can happen on a daily life. Um, and you know, just the, the, the routine is not the same every day. You know, we change it up a little bit. They could be doing, you know, like you said, they have, uh, their sex health. Um, they learn about drug education, um, character development. Um, there's so many different groups and so many different, um, activities and services that we go through in a daily, um, on a daily basis and a weekly basis that, you know, really helps them as they, you know, because it's not just about here, it's about what we can do to provide them yeah. to be successful when they leave the program. So sometimes they visit kids on my farm too. So sure. you got two kids there. So, right. so, and, and <laughs> I love it. We never know what's going to happen on YSS. Let's talk live. You might get kids, you might get goats, you might get, who knows. And I've got like a bunch of animals around here too, that might come out. Um, I, I want to say though, Tim, um, and I know I've shared this story, maybe I've shared it to you before, that when I went in to teach a class, there was a girl, and this was about six months ago, and this is kind of a kudos to yourself, um, but there was a girl that talked about the, and, I, and I'm not a bike rider, so that, that bridge, the right. big bridge that's out. High Trestle Trail, trail. High High trestle trail. trail. yep. I know, shame on me, take my Iowa card. <laughs> but yeah, the High Trestle, and but, and, and you were, I, I think, talking to her about it and how beautiful it was and how great it was when I literally, and Andrew, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but it was like a week or two weeks later, I came back and I, I think through the program or however she had been out to High Trestle Trail to see that bridge that she was just talked about or that she had ta been talked to about it. And she was gloating to me about how awesome it was and how great all through the program. And that's those kind of life experiences that you're talking about, right? Sure. I mean, that, that that's that type of, I mean, just, just great, you know, phenomenal experiences. And, you know, Tim, I know that you also have a bit of a story here. Um, sure. You, you have a, a, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Go but I'm it. reading in your bio that you're adopted. Sure. Yep. So, and can you, so where are you adopted or, or how'd this happen? Where'd it come? Sure. Um, so I was adopted to an agency called Holt International. I don't know if it's still around. Uh, I think it may be, uh, but I was adopted from an orphanage in uh, Seoul, South Korea. Wow. Um, and, and I'm going to give a bunch of information out that I do not give out. And the clients tell me about what my real name is, my birth name is. But um, so I came from an orphanage named after uh, uh, a man named with the last name Kim. And so my name is Kim Sangho. That's my birth name. Um, and I was, my last name came from this man from this orphanage. Um, never met the guy. Don't remember anything from it. But um, yeah, I was adopted uh, from this orphanage when I was about two and a half years old. I came to America when I was about four and a half, five years old. So it was about a two, two and a half year process. I know it was a long yeah. uh, process for my parents. Um, it was tough for them. But yeah, that's, I was adopted from there. And yeah. Wow. So, and, and now you work. And again, when I was reading your bio, I, again, I, I've got to highlight this because you work in a residential facility and you have personal experience with this as well, just like Andrew does, correct? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I went through a program out in Cedar Rapids um, for uh, just more behavioral things. I struggled growing up. I think, uh, you know, like any other kid that walks through our doors, I struggled to find my purpose in life. Mm -hmm. I struggled because I was a little bit different than most other kids. Um, I had a really different background than most kids um, growing up. And my interests were a little bit different than a lot of the kids that growing up. And so I struggled through my adolescent years. I struggled to make connections and struggled to find what I was truly gifted and talented at. And, you know, the same story for a lot of these individuals that come through our doors, you know, they just, you know, they don't realize the potential they have. They don't realize um, 
the the gifts and the talents that they do have and just sometimes you know and that's the best part about working here is just you know you're you know every day might be you know the same but you know it's those days where a light bulb clicks on from one of them it's just like oh my god like i love doing this and like you said though, about the whole high trestle trail bridge like i never thought i'd like to do that and all that good all those good things so um yeah it's it's really easy for me to relate to these uh individuals that come and even some of the families and what they've been through to up to that point when they reach our doors and um it's um yeah it's again it's very satisfying to know that you know i can have an impact on them just like the people that worked with me when i was going through a residential treatment program has such an, a huge impact on me and like they knew i uh, touched base before how you know like oh tim you know i i really you know trust him and the staff i really connect with with and um you know all that I, I i have those same type of experiences when i went through residential treatment and in fact i still stay in contact with two or three of my counselors and staff that worked with me and helped me to get you know to where where, where i am today so i love it and, and i want to add something i spoke with a young man who was graduating the program in mason city at five tonight um, and I always ask, hey, what advice would you give me? As CEO? How can we make this the very best program uh, for kids like you to go through? And he said, oh, I've got to think about it a little bit. And then he said, you know what? More people like Terry. And I said, tell me about Terry. He's like, well, Terry's in recovery and he gets me. And so just like Tim gets these kids, just like I get these kids. Now, you don't have to have uh, experienced um, addiction in order to work in our programs. But for those folks that have... Those folks that have experienced adversity, overcome it, gone through treatment, yeah. um, are in recovery. We want those folks at YSS. We're hiring those folks. If you want to have a purpose-driven career and focus on you know, transforming lives, using your personal experience um, in order to help other people, uh, yss.org slash careers. We, we, we need more people with lived experience uh, working with our kids. Come join us. Yeah. <laughs> Come join us. We are a family. And that I hear echoed constantly um, that, that we are a family. So I, I asked at the beginning that I kind of wanted um, us to cover three areas, kind of like prior to admissions, um, you know, kind of before admissions, during admissions, and then after admissions. So we've talked about kind of going through the process, what the day's like, what happens, and then and then we mentioned graduation too, and what a special, awesome day that is. I've heard it's actually it's supposed to be called recovery celebration because you don't graduate from okay. sobriety. You know, we're not going to graduate and go have a party. It's recovery celebration, uh, and sure. it's, it's it's you know uh, acknowledgement of this this fresh start, this new opportunity. Okay, so then what after? So so after and and Andrew, one more time, you called it recovery celebration. 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 Recovery celebration. Sorry. Is it your goats? No, that doesn't sound like a goat, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> sound like okay. So after the recovery celebration, then what happens? What do we do, or or how do we do? We provide ongoing support. What does that look like? So, sure, Timothy. Yeah, um, actually, that um, that support that uh, we provide after the celebration. I mean, it doesn't start there. It starts, you know, right when they walk through our doors. Um, I mean, whether that be you know reaching out to schools for them to get back into school. I mean, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these kids that come in, they haven't been at school for a long time or at all. Um, and so, reaching out to schools, um, reaching out for uh, employment. Um, you know, I think the most important thing that we need to think about here when it comes to their daily lives and for them to be successful is that is having that structure. A lot of these kids come in and they just kind of do what they want or they don't listen to parents and they just go off and do their own thing. And so building that solid foundation of structure, um, whether it be going to school, playing sports, getting a job um, and those types of things, it's very important to get that, get that, get that ball rolling on that right away. So that, you know, when they do walk out those doors after that recovery uh, celebration, they have a plan, they have a map for them to like, okay, I need to do this. I need to start this. This is going to help me be successful. Like you just yeah. said, a plan, a guideline. That is sure. awesome. Yeah, that's right. The, the staff do a really great job. And, and I'll, you know, as CEO of the organization, I'll admit this is the area that that we need uh, more attention than any other. 
Uh, four out of five kids that enter our program graduate or complete the program successfully. Four out of five. And I, I meet with each one of them. And while I don't have the same day-to-day -day interaction that Tim does, I, I truly believe that four out of five of them, the majority of those kids that I meet with, they've had a transformational experience. They want to stay sober. Yet often sure. we're sending them home to environments where their using buddies are, their drinking buddies are, the old playgrounds and playmates. Um, it's, it's difficult to transition home as a young person. I know that personally. I, I know that I struggled, but I also know what it takes to leave an adolescent addiction treatment program and stay sober one day at a time for almost 25 years. And so we're working with 12 step programs, bridge the gap so that uh, individuals, when they go on home visits, it's a little different now because of COVID. Um, and we've maintained operations throughout uh, the pandemic. You know, we continue to admit kids, we continue to you know work through this, but we've got fewer visitors coming and we don't send the kids home on the weekends like we normally do. But generally they're encouraged to get to meetings when they go home. We get them connected with 12 step meetings um, we uh, implemented uh, a new uh, program a couple years ago called a recovery advocate where their job is specifically to reach out to kids that have left the program to check in with them, to touch base, to see how they're doing. And I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, well, I don't know, it was three months ago or six months ago, probably about six months ago, right about the, the start of the year. Um, we received a grant from Telligent Health. Uh, thanks, Matt McGarvey, for your support and taking a, a risk on us. We are the only agency in the state of Iowa that's providing an evidence-based program through a company called HS, a connections app. So we've got an app. I've got an app on my phone. I'm a participant. I interact with staff and kids. Um, it's support. It's daily reminders. It's a, a survey every day. You log into this thing and it says, how confident are you that you'll stay sober today? If you say I'm not confident, it alerts our staff. Our staff reach out. You want to talk about what your goals are, what your motivations are. It's all in that app. You want to get connected with 12-step meetings. It's in that. You want to um, uh, identify risky areas for you to travel to. It's got a geolocation system such that if you move into a risky area, it notifies folks. So, um, you know, it's, it's this, uh, while the funding often, I hate to say that, while the funding for treatment runs out at the point that the kids leave, we try to get them connected with therapists in their home community. We do telehealth. We continue. We've got a program called multidimensional family therapy where if they're engaged in that program, we continue to do that. Um, sometimes in their homes, sometimes over telehealth, um, we get them connected with local resources. And now I'm so excited. This uh, I just, Matt Voorhees, who I think is on, shared some statistics today about um, the uptick in uh, participants in the app, and I'm really excited for that. And this is, I mean, like you just said, from start to end, I mean, I love that. It encompasses, and, and you know, Andrew, as our CEO, um, let me put you on the spot here and say, what would you like to ask folks to do to help? to get involved with this? Well, I've got some boys riding dirt bikes in the background, so sorry about that. I've been inside all day long. Um, uh, here's what I'm thinking. Well, YSS's mission is simple. To, two things, to create hope and opportunity by putting kids first. Tim talked about the way that he and his staff and that program put kids first. There are families out there right now who are struggling, who are desperate, who don't know where to turn, who are with, without hope. And, and essentially, I want folks to know that recovery is possible and treatment works. And yep. different than cancer, addiction and mental health is something that oftentimes happens behind closed doors. Um, families don't talk about it with their friends necessarily. Um, there's a stigma that still exists where people are ashamed. When somebody has cancer, what happens? The community rallies around them. People bring over meals. They do fundraisers. When a kid's got addiction and the cops are showing up at your house or, you know, the kids acting out in ways that, you know, aren't necessarily acceptable, families uh, recoil and and they don't necessarily know how to ask for help. So so my message as the CEO of YSS, as an alumnus of this program, as a, as a guy who believes in the work that Tim and his staff are doing every day, is that treatment works and recovery is possible. And the very best thing to do is to reach out to a program, reach out to a trusted fund, reach out to a, a provider of sorts and, 
and ask about treatment, ask about addiction treatment, see where you can get connected. We'd love to have you come to YSS, but, but if you go anywhere, um, that, that is the most important thing that you're getting these kids connected with, uh, with help. And M Mark, uh, Mark DeYoung is a residential addictions, uh, I'm sorry, residential admissions manager. This guy, uh, one of my best hires ever, um, uh, he and I had coffee uh, in Ankeny a few years ago, and we were talking about something else, and I just feel like God led us to a conversation about this role. And uh, the fact that uh, he's in his role, um, there's nobody better than Mark at connecting families that are desperate and need hope and kids that need treatment with, with a program that can really help. So um, this is a guy, there, you've got his email address, you've got his uh, phone number, 233-4930, but essentially you can just go to the website, you can get all the information. A, a lot of the slides that were up there tonight, um, what a daily routine looks like, what, you know, what, what the program looks like, what the admission criteria is, um, and, and the very best thing to do is just give Mark a call. Yeah, and one thing, Andrew, and you hit on it, that you're talking about all these different parts um, that the staff kind of ultimately cater to with the youth. And that's one thing I love. Um, since I personally have got more involved with the houses, team, is I can see all these different services in all the areas that are being hit on with the youth. And I see a question um, from Jackie up here, because I was checking our little question box here. And it's asking Tim to share a story about a young man who used walking as a coping mechanism to use upon returning home. So this is kind of like I say, you're you're kind of hitting on all these areas with the youth. So Tim, do you do you recall this? Sure. Um, and before I dive into that, I I want to emphasize the importance of uh, a point that Andrew just made about connections. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why. Um, staff come here to work here because they want to build those connections. They want to build that foundation for clients as they walk in and then when they leave because just because they leave and um, you know they might not see each other or talk, talk to each other as much anymore uh, doesn't mean that connection still isn't there and so um, I, I think it's really important to understand that um, when they do go home they think about those those bonds and those connections that they made with these staff as they walk through these doors and then they leave and it, it makes a lasting impression i know that firsthand because again i went through that a residential program and i still talk to two or three of my past staff and counselors that i used to work with so that that word connections that's that's a huge part in what we do here we build those connections that you know can last for a lifetime uh beyond these doors and so getting back to the story yeah we have a young man that um you know he really struggles with his anger and he really struggles to um, um just be able to control that anger and to you know harness it in a, uh, an appropriate and healthy way and so um it got to the point where, you know it, when he got angry we just had to remove him from the uh from the uh, from the room and you know it, it got to the point where like hey we're gonna go for a walk we're gonna get away from this and we're just gonna you know let your mind roam free and get your mind off of that and so you know, going on a walk and just talking with the, uh, that staff that he talked to and um, being able to process what just happened and how he can learn from that uh, that problem. Uh, it became, he realized like, hey, this is something cool. Um, and another thing, you know, that builds into our everyday life is uh, going out for wellness. Um, so uh, this young man uh, just realized like, hey, going for a walk it helps like clear my mind. And so, you know, not only was he doing that when he needed to break away from that anger and, you know, just get away from things, he started doing it on his own free time just for wellness, you know, like go, they, he loves going to, on walks through the woods and at parks and uh, seeing animals and nature, the river, messing around and doing all that stuff. And so he realized like, hey, and this is that kind of like an epiphany he had. And I had a chat with him about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and this is when he brought up. I never realized like going on a walk, like before he thought that, oh, that's what my mom and dad do. do and I'm not gonna do that, that does nothing for me. And now he realizes like, this is a great mechanism, coping mechanism for him to use that, you know, that he learned here that now he's gonna uh, transfer to when he walks out these doors and goes back home actually giving i mean uh, giving the skills that i mean sure. are like skills i mean uh, skills that all of us can use for sure but uh, teaching them at an early age and definitely um, during a time that they can utilize them. so 
Um, we have now, and, and I don't know who wants to take this again, because I'm scanning our, our comment box, which again, thank you for those who are chiming in here. Um, absolutely love them. And before I, I go on to this comment, if, if for those of you who are watching this recorded, if you want to ask any questions or comments, you can go to www.yss.org. Um, there's a, a plethora, if I can use that word plethora. It's my special word. Plethora. You, yeah, you use it every week. So you might as well use it again. <laughs> okay, so but a plethora of information out there. Um, uh, so please, please chime in there and, and check out all the resources. But we have um, Ashley asking here, are there any plans on developing a halfway house or a transitional living program for recovering youth or plans to further expand to other areas in the state? Andrew, I think this would be one for you to take. Yeah, well, Ashley, thanks so much for the uh, question. When I went to treatment, uh, instead of two residential programs, uh, one for boys and one for girls in Ames, which is what we have now, another boys program. And, uh, Mason City, we used to have a primary residential treatment for boys and girls. It was co-ed and a halfway house for boys and girls. Now we know today uh, it is a best practice to separate boys and girls, especially teenage boys and girls um, when they're going through treatment. So um, we're the only uh, uh, gender responsive program in the state uh, that's got separate locations for uh, female clients and male clients. Um, we, we are exploring uh, opportunities to create uh, a campus uh, in which uh, we would deliver best-in-class treatment um, across the state. What we're doing with the $4 million renovation in Francis Lauer in Mason City is so inspiring um, that we want to do something similar in central Iowa, too. So we're not ready to announce any big plans, but um, we are planning. We are thinking about how best to deliver uh, services. And at the point that we've got a new facility and a campus in central Iowa, Youth Recovery House and 712 House, those are perfect spots yeah. for halfway houses. So I, I, I definitely see it uh, in our future. I think it makes a lot of sense. 90 to 120 days is, is great. It, it is a significant amount of treatment. Four to five kids have transformed lives. Having said that, oftentimes you need some additional time um, in order to, you know, continue to get, make community connections in order to have some more stability, create some additional plans. There's a st statistic that says if you can keep someone sober for a year, there's just a 50% chance of relapse. If you can keep them sober for four years, just a 15% chance of relapse. So while nobody has a four-year program, what if we could bring kids in residential treatment, halfway house, transitional living of sorts, get them connected with a four-year degree program at Iowa State, for instance, and, you know, have them graduate uh, with a degree and just a 15% chance of relapse. That That's our big vision. And uh, um, while nothing happens overnight, uh, I haven't lost sight that we, um, every day, will be working to create the very best addiction treatment program for kids uh, that we can. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I love this because with and I, I, I know I love YSS and I brag about it all the time, but I mean the vision and, and just the expansion and, and how we do grow, Andrew. I mean, how much we've grown even since you've been CEO and, and how the expansiveness and like what Tim was talking about, the reaches that we hit all throughout the state and how we hit prevention, how we hit residential, how we hit foster care, how we hit um, uh, pregnancy and, and parenting and even teen parenting and adult parenting. I mean, all throughout. So um, such great programs. Again, if you're tuning in, please, www.yss.org is as simple as I can say it. Um, just go there, uh, check out all of the information. Um, absolutely. Hey, Timothy Martinez, I want to say a special thanks to you. Um, for everything that you have done, everything that you are doing. You've got a big job. I mean, the job, that, yeah, you just chuckled. I saw that. <laughs> You've got, I mean, you, you are, I mean, how many residential houses are, are you managing? Three? Two. Two. So, and that is a big job with all of that, all the program, everything that we just went through. So thank you for doing all of that and all of the experiences that you're giving these youth. Andrew Allen, 
Do I need to say thank you? No, no you don't need to say thank you because I want to say thank you. Uh, I've got my YSS shirt on. You can't see it, but essentially uh, we gave all of our employees through uh, the pandemic and oh. uh, these, these shirts that say, yep, we're essential um, and YSS staff. And, and I want to say the same thing, Rusty. I mean, thanks so much for, for your leadership and uh, hosting these Let's Talk Live uh, events. This essentially was your idea for your program. And um, we were able to parlay it and uh, talk about a lot of different things that are going on. You've got a big team behind you. I want to thank all of them. But but I really want to thank Tim, too. My, yeah. my COO, Belinda Meese, who's a rock star, um, says there's uh, the two most difficult jobs uh, at YSS or any nonprofit. And one of them um, is the seat that I sit in. But the other one is direct care staff, the, yeah. the folks that are on the front lines working with these kids day in and day out. Um, we do see turnover in these roles because they're high stress roles. They're difficult. They don't necessarily always feel appreciated. Kids are hard to work with because yeah. they get their mind made up and they want to go in a, a direction and, and it's difficult to break through. But, but Tim is a guy who's committed three years, who's got a personal story, who's doing this to create, not for a job. I'm sure he appreciates the paycheck that we pay him. But he's doing this because he wants to transform other kids' lives. He wants to invest in them in a way that um, they're going to grow up and achieve their own successes. So, uh, t Tim, uh, I'm grateful for the three years that you've committed to YSS. You are an essential employee. Um, and uh, I'm so uh, blessed to work for, for YSS and to have such a great team. So thanks so much. Absolutely. Yeah. And Thanks to all those out there who have been watching this. I, I have one final request. If you are watching this now, or be it that you're watching it maybe a little bit later on, um, there is a share, a little share button, I think, on, on Facebook. Hey, just share this. Um, get the word out there. Um, spread this word, because what we do and how many folks uh, that can be helped absolutely uh, monumentally important. So again, thanks for everybody for tuning in. I also want to invite folks to tune in next week. Um, YSS Live, Let's Talk Live, Let's Talk Facebook Live. I'm mixing my words up right now, but Andrew Allen. Two oh, weeks yeah. in a row. I know. <laughs> what is up with this? This is getting a little bit crazy here, but Andrew, Andrew, what's going on next week? I got you well, now, so you can just talk uh, about it. Well, see, here's, I'm kind of interested. I'm looking at that picture, and I know that that picture of me is four and a half years old because I've been in the job almost. You're not going to go. Years. I've got to ask you, how, how old is that picture of you? Um, Actually, it's only <laughs> about, I think, eight, well, seven years, I think, seven years, right. you know. But yeah, we'll All we'll right. do a, we'll do a, new, a YSS new photo shoot. We'll get a new photographer. That is a great idea. Yep. All right. I look like really, I'm, yeah. I'm, anyway, uh, next week's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, we are on a fiscal year that ends June 30, so uh, next week will be the start of our 2021 fiscal year. And so, what a great time to reflect on uh, you know all the things that we had done. Uh, over the past year. Uh, I've been in the role for five years on July 1st, and um, I'm excited to talk about uh, the future of YSS and our vision for where we're going. Awesome. Awesome. So, all right. Well, Timothy Martinez, YSS Residential Specialist, Andrew Allen, our YSS President and CEO, thank you for joining this YSS Let's Talk here on Facebook and Facebook Live every Thursday night. Guys, spread the word if you're watching this. And now that I've got critiqued on my photo, I'm going to. It looks great. It's a great I'm photo. Work on myself a little bit before next week. And what people do all know is that Rusty's a performer, and so that I'm sure was like a professional your your performance photo when you did gigs. It was actually. I uh, next one. You know what? I'm going to put the one with me and my saxophone. We're going to get this, and we're going to get that one. That's right a good here. one. Can I screenshot you with the goat? And that's what we're going to put for you. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this YSS Let's Talk and see everybody next Thursday. See you guys. Take care. Bye.